Last time I talked to Professor Seaford, he gave me his suggestions if he had cancer, the stuff he'd be doing. He's got tons of studies that he's shared with me that there's a lot of evidence. 14 to 21 days, what happens to the size of those tumors? People are like, how are you not passing out after four or five days? And, I, and I, I'm not carb dependent. I'm ketone dependent. So I always tell people, if you want to fast, I can teach you how to do it, but you got to change your diet first. You can't just jump into a fast being a carb dependent person. Welcome to the Plant Free MD Podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining me with another episode of the Plant Free MD Podcast. Today, I have very good... Um, very good uh, friend of mine that I've become uh, better friends with recently, Jeff to Prosperous, who has a fantastic story uh, with his his journey going carnivore. Jeff, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Dr. Shafee. It's an absolute uh, privilege and honor to be with you, that's, as always. That's very kind. Um, so for people who haven't come across you, can you tell us a, a bit about yourself and, and your story? Sure. Thanks, uh, Dr. Shafee. Um I kind of start introducing myself in a little different way for anybody that's heard me before. So once again, my name is Jeff DeProsperous and I, I live in Canada. Uh, Ontario is the province and um, I'm a husband. Uh, I have a beautiful wife of uh, 17 years, been together 24 years. I, we have two sons together, uh, Peter and Dante, they're 15 and 13. and um, I'm really uh, proud of them, proud father. Um, uh, I've been a high school phys ed teacher for the past 21 years at the high school that I actually went to in my hometown. Um, I have two university degrees. I have a, a degree in, in kinesiology and I, kinesiology and phys ed, and then I have an education degree. Um, I have the former uh, varsity athlete. I played soccer for two schools. Um, I still consider myself an athlete. I try to get in games as much as possible. I've been coaching uh, sports for the last 21 years as a teacher, phys ed teacher as well. It kind of goes innately together. And um, just in the past 22 months, I've changed my diet. And I, I started with uh, a little key uh, Keto probably for a couple months, switching into ketovore for another couple months. And I've been pretty carnivore for the past about 18 months. And I find I get uh, stricter and stricter as we, uh, as I continue on my journey um, from week to week, it's always different um, because I have an eating week and I kind of have a non eating week. So sometimes I get a little more strict with lion diet and I'm really enjoying it. And I guess the the main reason why I switched to a carnivore diet is because uh, I was diagnosed with uh, stage four colon cancer in April of 2022. So hopefully that's good intro. Yeah, well, it, it, well, it definitely is. And um, thank you for that. And thank you for coming on and, and telling your story. Obviously, it's it's a pretty nasty thing to go through. And, you know, having the focus of conversations be about you know something nasty that you're going through isn't always easy so i appreciate you taking the time and and uh and help and you know telling your story and and hopefully helping other people Thank, thanks dr shafi and i just one more thing i when i first started my journey uh especially with the diet just months before that i started watching a lot of youtube mm -hmm. and you're one of the ones that i was watching along with other uh pretty popular doctors on youtube um so the youtube world helped me out a lot and so and so have you so uh i just want to thank you before we get going oh well well yeah i'm, I'm glad that the videos helped you know that's that's why they're there so well so how how did you come across all this before obviously you know the traditional medicine you know most centers won't tell you to go on a ketogenic diet um, so how did, how did, how did this play out? You know, when, when you first, um, got diagnosed and you're talking with your oncologist about it, um, you obviously decided to go 
a bit sideways or did they, did they tell you to go this way? Uh, definitely, uh, my mainstream doctors, like my oncologist and a couple of cancer surgeons that I was first talking to, they definitely didn't, um, guide me towards the regimen that I'm on today. Today, I had to kind of create it myself. They basically told me at first, I thought I was going to have surgery, but then we realized, um, the cancer had metastasized to the liver and I was deemed inoperable and incurable. So really chemo was the only uh, thing that my face-to-face -face doctors were telling me I needed to do. And I needed to start that right away. So when I got diagnosed in April, 2022, I didn't start chemo till about end of May, 2022. So this spring I'll be approaching two years since I started chemo. I've done 38 rounds of chemo, but oh. A couple, a couple rounds in, uh, probably about a month or a month and a half in, um, a good friend of mine, uh, his name's Dwight. He's a, 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 a fellow that I've coached high school sports with, uh, cause I first started coaching his daughter about eight years ago and he's been coaching a lot of youth sports, basketball, volleyball, soccer, and we coached together. I was kind of the athletic director at my high school and I was kind of hiring him as a volunteer and we we became really good coaching friends but when he knew I was off and he knew I was doing this cancer uh battle treatment he said hey Jeff I heard you're off work I hope everything's okay he sent me a text message because I kind of shut myself off to the world I wasn't really going out in public I was kind of just in shock of what I was going through and he said hey do you mind if I start sending you some videos and I didn't know what videos he was going to send me. Like I, I thought maybe he was going to send me like some like, you know, movies to watch to help my mindset or, or something. Right. I'm like, whatever. Sure. And next thing you know, the, I think the first, I well, I actually know the first video he sent me uh, was Dr. Berg uh, interviewing um, this French fellow from France uh, mm. that had stage three, four colon cancer that he did uh, a 21 day fast and he ate red meat every single day, uh, sorry, ribeye steaks every single day. And I watched that video and I was like, first of all, I was sh in shock about two things. First of all, totally blown away how the human body can not eat for 21 days, uh, water fast only. And then how he then decided for, I don't know, months just eat, only ribeye steaks. I think he was green juicing at first, but then he cut that out because he realized it wasn't working. So he just did ribeye steaks. And I'm like, hold on a second. He has colon cancer. I have colon cancer. Everything I'm reading about says red meat causes colon cancer. And he's doing this. So when I first watched that video, I thought, well, this is nice that my friend Dwight sent this to me, but I, I it was hard for me to believe. Just like when anybody gets sick and people suggest to do things, I know it's hard for people to, to believe unless you're talking to your qualified professional doctor. But anyways, Dwight kept sending me videos. You know, he started sending me your videos. He started sending on the carnivore diet. He started sending me Sean Baker's, Dr. Sean Baker, uh, Dr. Kendi Berry, um, even uh, Dr. Paul Saladino. Um, he started sending, keep sending me these videos. And they started to really catch my attention. And I started to delve into the, just learning about how cancer is a metabolic disease. And, you know, I started diagnosing myself how I caused it. Uh, it's, it's, it wasn't a fluke. I think it was my lifestyle. And then I, and then I trained myself to think I caused this, I can reverse it. And uh, so that's, that's how I uh, got into this journey in the YouTube world and carnivore diet and following all these great doctors, including yourself. Yeah. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at carnivore bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat for those times that you're out hiking, road tripping or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat 
and salt if you want it. The carnivore bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat only products, the more meat only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right, thanks guys. Well, that's awesome. Uh, and it was great that you were open-minded enough. Well, it was great you had a friend, first of all, that was that was able to share this with you and that you were in a place that you were, you were able to listen. Not everybody is. And so I, you know, I've, I've met people that, you know, they've had family members and they've tried to sort of send these things and, and their family members are very resistant to it because they're like, they, they, they've just sort of just given up and they're saying, Hey, don't, they all, you know, from the sound of it, they, they, they sort of don't want to hear something like that. It may be that it, it they're afraid of sort of false hope or something, but yes. you know, they're just sort of like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to just do what the doctors tell me. And that's it, which is fair enough. You know, I mean, it's, it, it really, you, you are going out on a limb, you know, trusting, you know, these other things, but then when you start looking into it, you start looking at the studies, you start looking at the research, you start looking at people like professor Seafried, you look at, you know, Fred Everard, who had, who had that experience with colon cancer as well. Then it starts saying, okay, well, well, maybe there is something there. And I believe Fred was, it, it's funny because it's, it, yeah, exactly. They say red meat causes colon cancer. It doesn't, you know, any, any decent study shows that it has no association whatsoever. And, and that, that vegetables and fiber are the best thing for you. And yet Fred was a vegan for 12 years. Didn't touch meat, didn't touch red meat in over a decade. Yes. And then there you go. He has, you know, uh, advanced colon cancer. And then he went on just red meat. I think he was doing keto at first, but yeah, the fiber was just really hurting him and because he had a very, very narrow stricture and he was in so much pain with the fiber, he just couldn't eat it. And so he just ended up just doing red meat. And and then, you know, he put that into remission, had a recur relapse, but then has now put it back into remission again. So yes. it's, um, yeah, we're doing exactly the opposite of what they say. No, absolutely. And I was able to relate to Fred quite a bit, like you said, um, he, I think he was a martial arts instructor or mm. something. He was very, very yeah. fit and active all the time. Same thing with me. Like everyone always like, you know, Jeff, the phys ed teacher has cancer. He's, he, you know, he's been active. He's been fit. He's been teaching phys ed classes uh, for 21 years. It, it was quite shocking, not only to myself, but I think everybody. So with the Fr Fred's story really, hit, really hit home. And then uh, I think there was another fellow by the name of Guy or Guy that kind of did something mm. similar. And, uh, and, and in terms, of, especially during, in terms of fasting. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. 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 These uh, uh, guy Tenenbaum. Yeah, yes, that's very, correct. Very yeah. Nice guy. Yeah. Um, he didn't do full carnivore, but very keto, you know? And yes. Um, yeah. Which is, which I think is, is a big part of this. Um, you know, just going back to something you said, you said you thought that this was, was your lifestyle that brought this about what, what do you think? your about your yes. lifestyle that that brought this brought this about well Probably first off uh, anyway. no but if we <laughs> want to talk about d d diet first of all mm -hmm. um and i think you and i have something in common i'm not i think you're of the italian heritage uh is your last name chafee italian or chafee well it it's it's old so you know my family the chafees came to america in like the 1500s so all my ancestors all the original new england colonists uh, new like, england yeah it's just every, everybody everybody's here was from like the 1500s 1600s i've got pilgrims on both my mom and dad's side and um you know um things like that so england 500 years ago and yes and things like that but then before that i don't know i did one of those like uh 23 me dna sort of tests and it basically just had this this massive map of, of like where all my genes came from and it was just basically the old roman empire so i guess in that in that regard you could well you know what I, I no i could tell i'm actually uh if people ask me what part of italy my family's from um we're from an hour south of rome so yeah. i that's the type of italians we are and and you look very similar like i feel like i'm yeah. related to you in terms of that sense <laughs> and and you remind me of a roman gladiator too so <laughs> um <laughs> Anyways, what I was trying to say is I, I thought maybe you did have an Italian background, but I, I grew up um, maybe way with back. A 
but yeah, way back, way yeah, back. But you, yeah, but you didn't have American a stay at home. 500 years at this point, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't like, I had a stay at home Italian immigrant mother, uh, mm -hmm. that raised me. And, uh, you know, my father was a barber. He came over from Italy and he was cutting hair and he did that his entire life. Mm -hmm. My mother, uh, my entire, she worked a little bit, but my entire life since I was born, she was a stay at home mother. And she was that type of mother where I say, I, I, I kind of relate to that that movie Super Size Me where he talks about his mother and his memories of his mother always being in the kitchen. Well, that was that's my entire that's the truth too. My mother uh her, the kitchen was her domain do, do, domain. Like that's where she stayed that's where she was all the time and her kitchen was clean and there was fresh good Italian cooking. Uh when people say, "Oh, you must eat lots of pizza and pasta." Yeah, we do eat a lot of pasta but my mom is also very uh was very modern day italian mediterranean uh fresh vegetables uh great meat very good at cooking meat um well i guess in the in the mediterranean world a well-balanced mediterranean diet where after meals uh we wouldn't have sweets or ice cream or cakes we would have fruit and in the italian household fruit would be the dessert so that would come out afterwards and we'd have espresso after every meal so I, I was raised eating really, really well, I thought. And, and, and it was good if you're, if you're metabolically healthy, I think. Now, the thing is, when we grow up and we move out, uh, things change. And I think that changed probably when I was like 18 or 19 and I first moved out and I went to university. Um, and, I, you know, you get, that, uh, you get that food card from the university where you're tapping to get your food either from restaurants or cafeterias. And then after I was living, after I moved out of a dorm, I was, had roommates and, you know, when the kitchen is so disgusting because you're living with university guys that you have to go eat out all the time instead of cooking your own food. Um, I was doing that. And then, you know, you start your career. I started my career as a teacher at the age of like 22, 23, and it's fast paced and you're in your career and you're probably not, I probably wasn't eating the greatest. Then, you know, I then fast forward a little bit, a few years later, I get married, um, my wife has a career. Uh, she she works in the finance industry, and and she's her her job is fast paced. My job is fast paced. So we're probably not eating the greatest. We're probably not cooking the most home cooked meals. Then you add in kids to that scenario, and it and it gets even worse because as soon as I had two sons, I'm like, okay, two and a half years old. When they're both two, and a, they're doing sports. They're doing soccer. They're doing hockey. They're doing basketball. We're, we're going, and I'm on the go all the time, every night, every weekend. And I still am. Um, so, we, you know, we're eating Subway. We're eating uh, slices of horrible pizza, card-filled pizza. And, you know, constantly doing that for about, you know, 15 to 18 years uh, as, a, as a teacher, uh, a married person, a family man. That's the, li that's the lifestyle change in terms of diet. I went from eating very clean, my Italian mother, home cooked Mediterranean style meals, very clean, nothing out of packages. We never ate out at restaurants there. Like we maybe went to Red Lobster once every three months for a treat to the lifestyle where I'm on the go and I'm tapping to get meals all the time. And uh, it, I think that affected me huge after, you know, in retrospect, when I'm looking at my diet, you know, I think that was part of it. That's not the that's not the hundred percent main reason, but it it was probably a big reason, and it was probably a big reason um, for when even the primary tumor got going. I fed it. I fed it with uh, with you know you said Professor, Professor Seifert's taught me with especially with glucose. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I you know I I continue to feed it because I the tumor was is but probably been in me right now for about that primary tumor for about six to seven years they could tell by the size of it so that the diet was one thing uh dr shafee and then you know there was a little bit of um me assessing my lifestyle in the months of january and february for the past 15 years when it's cold out and lack of vitamin d i think the lack of vitamin d um just the stress from a career uh on your cells the oxidative stress uh and just life stress and, um, another thing, you know, I, I look back and I think, I think about alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't really drink during the school year, uh, but I had two and a half months off every year for about, you know, like 18, 19 years, uh, half of June, July, August into September. 
where I'm hanging out at my house and, and uh, doing yard work and drinking beers throughout the day, barbecue and drinking beers, having glasses of wine at dinner, um, having some Italian liqueurs if company come over. So, I, you know, you do that for like 16, 17, 18 years. And I'm thinking, and now all the studies that, are, you know, the World Health Organization is putting out or, or, or Health Canada or the U.S. Health, they're saying like, to reduce cancer causing, you need to have zero to two drinks a, a week is the new is the newest uh, suggestion to reduce cancer. So I, I, I'm putting all these things, uh, you know, alcohol, oxidative stress, uh, vitamin D deficiency, uh, and then mainly diet, and you add all those things up. And no wonder I have this metabolic disease, I like to call it, uh, that I'm dealing with right now yeah well um yeah it, it's it's funny um my my mom was like that she she loved cooking she had over 500 cookbooks you know just just estimating I, it could have been more she read all of them she loved she's used all of them she's loved cooking so every every different sort of ethnic sort of uh cook everything she just loved it so you know italian Moroccan, French, everything, everything. She just, just really enjoyed cooking. So she was always cooking. She was always doing stuff. We always had fresh food. We always had fresh meals. And, you know, my dad, you know, obviously my upbringing was with that. When I moved out, I, I tended to do the same. And, um, you know, thankfully, you know, about that time I went carnivore originally. And so I was just cooking and just eating meat the whole time. And then that just sort of became a habit. I just always cooked. And so that, that worked for me, but my dad always, always, always had home cooked meals. He, yeah. He never liked going to restaurants, you know, and he just thought it was just a, a waste of time and money. You know, it's just like, yes. so we've got, we got better food at home. Like, why the hell are we doing this? And yeah, exactly. so, yeah. So we, you know, he always was eating home cooked meals, never had processed garbage ever and never drank, never smoked. And yet he got diagnosed with lung cancer. And, you know, thankfully got it early and before it had a chance to, you know, hit the lymph nodes or anything like that. So he didn't have to go through chemo just on follow-up now, but he had, you know, the whole top of his, of his right lung taken out. And so, wow. you know, which, which is pretty crazy. And, um, you know, I was just sort of thinking you know, with the alcohol, certainly that's going to affect this, but, you know, just think about sort of the, the one to two drinks a week or, or, um, you know, there's some sort of recommendations. You know, what were people doing drinking in the 1800s? Like a lot more than that, you know, more than one to two drinks a week. Most people, you know, a lot of people would drink even every day, especially in like the working class. You know, that's what I was saying. You know, the working class has a, has a drinking problem. And then the other, the flip of that was the drinking class has a working problem. You know, it's, yes. you have to go to yes, work. Yes, yes. It's annoying. So it's, um, you know, and yet at the cancer rates weren't, weren't anywhere near you know, what they are in the 20th century. So I think that's just a testament, a testimony to how bad this other stuff that we've added to it is too. In the twenties, 80% of men smoked and yet the lung yeah. cancer rates were far lower than they are in the latter half of the 20th century and today and less people are smoking now. And yet, you know, we're having more of a problem with it. So I think these, all these things add together and compound and like you say, just the, you know, the, the sort of the junk food and the pizza and all these sorts of things they just make a massive, massive difference. And, um, you know, on top of everything else, and then you add in the alcohol and all that sort of stuff. And it's just, you know, it just really, really raises your, your chances of being, uh, running into something pretty harmful. Um, you know, about that, um, I wanted to know how's it, how's it, everything going now? Like you're saying that, um, you know, this is going on for a while. You've gone through 30 plus rounds of chemo. How are you doing? How's everything going with Jeff? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, real good, I think. Um, and I think it, it, to be honest with you, it keeps getting better each day. Um, good. especially my, my mind and my body. Uh, the first year, uh, when I went from like May, uh, 2022, to May, 2023, 12 full months straight without a break of chemo. I had five scans and uh, the tumors on the liver, they were all shrinking, um, all five scans. And that was quite, my oncologist was pretty impressed with that. Um, 
because he said normally on the first scan, he says normally he sees the chemo working. He again, that's his world, the chemo world. So he thinks he believes the, the chemo is working. And then normally the second, third, fourth, fifth scan, it goes stable where you don't get any growth and then near the end you start getting growth and you got to switch chemos and stuff like that so yeah. for five scan five scans in a row i got shrinkage and the same amount of shrinkage like you know my larger tumors on my liver were like one like every single time they were getting one third of the size smaller so i was really happy um i actually asked for a break this past the past summer the, the summer of 2023 uh i had june july august half of september off i had a break of chemo but i, I kind of breaked a lot of things like i have a quite the regimen so i i wasn't seeing my natural path as much i was going on family vacations uh my father got sick uh and we had to check in in the hospital and he ended up passing away in the beginning of september so there was and there was a lot of things going on and when i went back to chemo in september i knew like I'm inevitably supposed to be on chemo for the rest of my life. Uh, that's what the doctors say. Um, when I went back to it, you know, I did it for three months, had a scan, two spots, my liver got a little bit bigger. Um, I took that a little bit hard for a moment, but it's not a setback. It's a side shuffle. I just, uh, they switched me uh, chemos to the second line, which is probably can be as effective as the first line in the chemo world. Um, so, and then I just, I just put my, you know, I kept my head up high now since, since, since then. And I've been on this new chemo and my, I'm, my regimen's getting stronger and stronger, especially with my diet, um, and all the other things I do. Um, I, I keep adding more to my regimen. Just yesterday I was traveling an hour out of town, uh, for hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Um, I've added that in. I've added uh, Wim Hof breathing, uh, cold plunging. Um, my regimen's a big long list uh, that mm -hmm. I've created along with uh, myself, at, you know, with the helps of my friend Dwight and and doctors that I've been watching. I've kind of created my own uh, regimen. Yeah, nice. And then so um, the bariatric chambers is, is an interesting one i was talking to my friend uh, dr paul mason he was actually saying that you can get sim you get similar results with exercise you know you're getting your, your yeah. heart rate up and you get your your body temperature up and it's and you start breathing hard and, and picking up your your respiration rate and uh, and that had similar similar effects as well are you are you exercising as well yeah exercise is part of my regimen yes that's a good yeah. point and, I, and it's a huge point to be honest with you i think diet fasting and exercise like i got about 12 item 12 to like 14 items on my regimen diet fasting and exercise are the three game changers mm -hmm. okay they're the biggest the biggest things and that, you're totally right with exercise dr shafee my natural path doctor when i connected with him he's the one that told me that i need to move mm -hmm. and he gave me a couple examples of former patients that have uh been put into remission that exercised a lot and um total opposite of what my colon liver specialist oncologist said they told me right off the bat take it easy don't push yourself don't lift heavy things uh go home and relax after chemo uh take your like total opposite and mm -hmm. uh you know i think uh i also watched uh i think it's on disney plus it's chris hemmingsworth the guy that plays thor he does a series of uh, like longevity things and he's got he's got stuff on like cold and heat therapy but he's also got an episode on exercise and he really delves into the science of exercise and he actually mentions on how it actually helps fight diseases like like cancer like you said um and mimicking hyperbaric it make it that it makes sense uh bringing a lot of fresh oxygen to uh the cells because they can't survive off of that they survive off of fermentation of glucose and glutamine what i've learned and Another thing, and it makes sense because even the Wim Hof breathing, uh, if you're doing it properly, they actually say that really mimics hyperbaric as, as, as well. Yeah, nice. And so you mentioned fasting as well. Obviously, Fred did that big 21-day fast, and that had you know a, a big effect for him. What's your, what's your fasting regimen at the moment? Yes, the 21-day fasting. Uh, my friend Dwight, I just want to say, 
he, he he's been telling me for the past like 22 months, Jeff, if I had what you had, I would have did 21 day fast right away. Mm. You would have did that. And, and, and I had a hard, and, and again, once again, what's good for somebody else might not be good for you yet. Not yet. But now I'm ready to do a 14 day to 21 day fast. I'm ready for that. Uh, my mind's ready for it. My body's ready for it. When I tell people, they think I'm, did you, the first thing they say is, did you check with your doctors about that? Is that safe? Mm -hmm. Are you allowed to do that with cancer? And I'm like, yeah, I check with my doctors on YouTube. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I check, I check, I check with my, uh, with my professor Seafred, who I'm on calls with quite a bit. And I'm, I'm in communication with all the time and he's a leading researcher in cancer around the world. So, but anyways, getting back to your question, uh, Shafi is when I first started, uh, I think it was after my second or third round of chemo, when I started embedding a regimen, um, I learned that, uh, I had a friend in Brantford that I met through my naturopath doctor. She's been in remission. Uh, she actually, I'm just going to give her a huge shout out to be honest with you. Um, you can get her, this is her book. It's called racing for a miracle and that's her exercising. And she had exactly what I had, but more like it was liver, lungs, lymph nodes. It was everywhere. Wow. And her part of her regimen, her name is Ronnie Campbell. Um, this is a great book for anybody that's going through cancer, especially, um, her, her fasting regimen around, and she had chemo just like me every other week on Wednesdays. Uh, she fasted three days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay. So a day before chemo day after chemo. Um, and that helped with her symptoms. Now she learned that through probably just studying. Uh, there's a doctor in Italy, Dr. Walter Longo, who I watch quite a bit too. Um, he, he speaks of, uh, of how that helps with symptoms, but I've delved into it a little more. Um, listening to Professor Seafred, Dr. Longo, uh, Jason Fung about about fasting and how not only is it going to help with symptoms, if you extend it a little bit longer, you know, I've learned about uh, autophagy, mitophagy, how your body goes into a self-cleansing state where the, you know, basically in layman terms, your, your good cells are going around eating up your bad cells. So I created a five-day fast that I've done probably... 38 times now every other week. So when I say I have an eating week, I have a non-eating week. So today is, uh, right now, this is Wednesday. I'm with you. Uh, this Sunday coming up will be my last meal because I have chemo next Wednesday. Uh, I don't eat Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, five full days. Um, chemo's on Wednesday. So when I get to chemo, I'm, I'm in ketosis and I, and I check my ketone levels and my glucose levels. And by the time I get to like the day after chemo, I'm in a real therapeutic state of ketosis that Dr. Professor Seifer has taught me where I try to keep my glucose ketone index as low as possible. Um, I think between one and two is like a good therapeutic state for someone battling cancer. So I, I've done, I do five days. Um, I have done the most I've done is eight full days. Um, Leading up to scans, I try to I try to go a little bit harder sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but I I'm ready now to do because talk. Last time I talked to Professor Seaford, you know, he gave me his suggestions if he had cancer, the stuff right. the stuff he'd be doing, and he said all the he he's got tons of studies um, that he's shared with me that there's a lot of evidence. Fourteen to twenty one days. Uh, what happens to the size of those tumors. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I'm ready to do it. I think I, I might do it. I might try to have a key, another chemo break and maybe do it when I'm off chemo, uh, and try to keep my electrolytes high, uh, and even some of my supplements, my vitamins and minerals that I take, because I, um, sometimes doing a prolonged fast, you gotta, especially the electrolytes I've learned, you gotta make sure that you're, uh, your, 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 your muscles uh, are ready for it. Your body's ready for it and um, make, you know, it helps being in it, it, the, the state of ketosis, which everyone talks about the keto diet. I think sometimes the keto diet is like people, it's like, it's turned into a fad almost where like all these food manufacturers slap the word keto on it and people don't even know what keto really means. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, 
the ketogenic diet, you know, being in a state of ketosis where your body is, you know, using nutritional ketones, body fat ketones, and then ketones produced by the liver when you really get into a fast and you need energy. People are like, how are you not passing out after four or five days? And I, and I, I'm not carb dependent. I'm i I'm ketone dependent. So it, you're, you're, I, I always tell people, if you want to fast, I can teach you how to do it, but you got to change your diet first. You can't just jump into a fast being a carb dependent person. Yeah, it's, it's certainly, it's certainly easier. You know, you'll have a, have a much, much easier transition. How, so how is your GCAT? So people don't know that's a glucose ketone index. That's something that Professor Seafried has shown that if you keep that ratio low of lower glucose to higher ketones, that this gives better outcomes in, uh, in certain ca cancer models. So how, how is that, how is that going when you're, you're eating and not eating? Do you, do you test every day or, or just sometimes? That's a good question. Um, in terms of monitoring, uh, myself uh, for the past, like, 22 months, Dwight, my buddy Dwight got me buying the Libra 2 by Abbott, uh, the diabetes company, the, the the monitor on the back of your arm for glucose. Um, and I've been monitoring that uh, the whole time. But then when I met, I think our, our good friend, Carrie Mann, uh, and, you know, being from the US, uh, there's a product called Keto Mojo um, that I can't get in Canada. You can't get it anywhere. You can't even buy it off of Amazon. Yeah. So yeah, it's crazy. Like I got, I got friends now that have cancer and they're in, in, in Ontario and they're like, where can I get this keto mojo? And they can't get it anywhere. Hmm. But if you got a relative in the States, they, you know, uh, Carrie shipped it over to me when he first met me right away, um, hmm. with a bunch of glucose strips and ketone strips. So the keto mojo is definitely, uh, probably a little more accurate than the sensor on the back of the arm, especially when it comes to gl glucose. And now I can measure my ketones which is awesome. I think the, the Abbott company is making a Libra four. I heard, um, I think it's out in the UK right now, uh, where, but does measure ketones as well. Um, so I'm looking into stuff like that, but the keto mojo, uh, mostly I think created alongside with professor Seaford to measure, to measure your GKI. So since I had it, since Carrie sent it to me, now I find this is where I'm really up in my game in terms of challenging myself. Right. Um, my son, Peter, my 15 year old, he's kind of like my, uh, my nurse. I go, Peter, go get the keto mojo. Let's check it out. So he always helps me. He's like, dad, turn your phone on, make sure the apps open. Uh, you know, we prick and then he, he, he gets the strips and he measures it for me while I'm holding my finger steady. It's just like a nurse would do, uh, for someone. So, um, when I'm eating, uh, I do check it probably every few days. I, I just know if I'm lying diet, I can get the glucose pretty low uh, and, and maybe my ketones up a little bit. I find I don't really get into the therapeutic state of ketosis. Uh, the numbers that Seaford suggests below 2.0, that's the ratio of the, G, the glucose to ketone index, mm -hmm. where my glucose is pretty low and my ketones are pretty high mm -hmm. um, unless I'm fasting. Mm -hmm. So that's the best time. Um, I'm still in a decent, I'm still in a decent state of low glucose and, um, a little bit of ketone production when I'm eating a carnivore diet, it's just harder to get to that therapeutic. They call Dr. Seifert, uh, calls it a therapeutic state of ketosis. It's very difficult unless I'm fasting. Now there, I guess there's, there's meds, um, that can help with that, uh, that professor Seifert speaks of all the time. Um, off market drugs, uh, stuff like that. So I'm starting to, you know, take suggestions. I think I was on a call with you once. I've, I've listened to you with some suggestions, uh, Dr. Tony Hampton, uh, Professor Seafred, and I'm trying to piece those things together. Like I've a natural supplement for, for example, is berberine. I've introduced, ber I've added berberine, okay, to lower the glucose. Um, the, the glutamine thing, uh, trying to suppress that. Uh, I'm learning right now. So I'm constantly learning. And I think, um, that's, what's keeping me motivated to keep going every single day. Mm -hmm. Um, the more I learn, the more I, I, I want, it's, it's kind of like a game. I'm challenging myself every day. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. The, so how have you noticed the, the berberine? Has that, has that helped lower the, the glucose in your, in your, uh, a little, sort of a little bit, that. a little bit, yeah, a little, <laughs> a little bit, and not as much as I want, uh, to be yeah. honest with you. And I think, 
sometimes with those natural substances, like I even, I asked Professor Seaford, uh, there's another supplement, uh, EGCG is the acronym. It's the chemical in broccoli and not broccoli. Sorry, green tea. Green tea. It's a, it's the chemical in green tea and matcha EGCG that uh, is supposed to be a cancer fighting. And the reason why it's cancer fighting because I think it's a glutamine blocker. Mm. Um, so I asked Professor Seaford. I'm like, if I I've been taking EGCG, is that he's like, oh, you're not, you're not. He he right away he says you're not going to be able to take enough EGCG. Like, and, and even Dwight, Dwight told me a while ago, you need to drink 10 to 15 green teas or matchas a day. And I'm like, I, sometimes the green tea makes me a bit nauseous. So I'm like, I can't do that a day. Like, um, but I still do take like EGCG is part, it's a, it's a pill part of my supplement regimen that I take every day. Um, glutamines, I think I'm mastering glucose suppressing. I just, I got to find a way to master the glutamine, uh, suppressing. Uh, because those are the two fuels that professor, professor Seaford makes cancer seem, and this is where I love listening to him. Cause he, he, he calms my mind. He's like, it, he, he says it, he comes yeah. out and says it. It's that, it's that easy. There's two, two things that grow cancer, glucose and glutamine. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. We block those cancer can't survive. And yeah. he also talks about, he talks about ketones and he says the ketogenic, he, he doesn't, Professor Seifert doesn't mention carnivore, but I know he's a fan of it because yeah. he talks about the, the keto. He talks about the ketogenic diet, and he says if you know, cancer can't survive off of ketone bodies as an energy source. Cannot, right? And and, he, and he's very adamant about that. So I love listening to Professor Seifert, and I know you've done a lot of the calls with him too. You know, I learn a lot from him. No, he, he's great. I I think you know that when I interviewed him, I was I was. I was really excited for that. I'd seen, I'd read a lot of his work. I'd seen a lot of his videos and I was just fascinated by the work that he was doing. And, and, and you're right because he, he is so confident about this because the man is just a pillar in that field. He, he knows what he's talking about and he can speak with, with such confidence and authority and knowledge you know it's just like this depth of knowledge so any question you have for him it's just like bam you know he's he's got the answer he's got the facts he's got the studies it's it's absolutely uh yeah. amazing and it's like yeah you know when and when when you show to talk to other doctors like well we don't really know we get these genetic problems all different he's like nope that's not what it is this is what it is this, no. is, what it is. this is how you fix it and it's just like that's right well, and as he said in, in our interviews like when you when you understand cancer biology this becomes much more simple you know, it's much more simple to treat when you understand the biology and the biomechanics of cancer. And I agree, you know, and, and he's proven this in, in animal studies and more and more and more human studies and trials. Now, it is a shame, you know, you're talking about the glutamine. People don't know yeah, cancer runs on glucose and glutamine. It needs a lot of them because the mitochondria are destroyed. So something called the Warburg effect named after Nobel Prize winner Otto Warburg, where he showed that Cancer is a metabolic mitochondrial disease. You, if you have healthy mitochondria, you cannot get uh, cancer. Seafried showed this as well by transplanting healthy mitochondria into cancer cells, and it suppresses the cancer. And you take the, 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 the nuclei from cancer cells with all the genetic changes. You put those into normal cells with normal mitochondria. They don't behave as cancer. You can clone them. You can get frogs and mice and things like that out of them. Then you take the mitochondria out. You put those into a normal cell with normal or with uh, normal DNA and they die or they behave as cancer and you, and they, and they, they just cause all these problems. So, you know, he's shown that he's, he's justified Dr. Warburg's work, but you know, we still call it the Warburg effect that these cancer cells need 400 times the amount of glucose to operate because it's let they're less efficient at it and they have a much higher metabolic rate. So very simple. You cut off the energy supply and that's going to slow, at least slow the growth at least but because they have such a high metabolic demand, what ends up happening is, is that they, they die because they, they can't function properly. They're not getting enough energy. And if you cut out the glutamine as well, then you're, they're only helping that as well. Colon cancer, different cancers need different type uh, amounts of glucose and glutamine. And, and um, the good thing about colon cancer is that it's, it's very glycolytic. It, it requires more glucose than, than glutamine to my understanding. Yes. Like, yes. Uh, GBM. It's the opposite, you know, so it's like they need, they need more glucose, glutamine uh, than glucose, but 
You attack them both, you know, and no, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm, le- I'm learning. I just learned something there by listening to you, Dr. Shafee. And cause I'm just, it's piecing it together. Cause the last time I was with Seaford, he spoke about the metastasized livers, uh, the, the, sorry, the metastasized colon, uh, cancers that are in my liver. They depend on glutamine. So my primary is mm. on glucose and there, I, I, I picked that up somewhere yeah, and it kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of making sense because yeah. I know by the size of my stools that my, my, my primary tumor is getting smaller and, and in my head, I know I need to master this glutamine suppressant. So I'm, it, it, it's amazing how, you know, listening to you, I'm like, oh my goodness, this sounds so easy. Like, can't they just extract the bad mitochondria and put new mitochondria in those cells? Like I'm, I'm, mm. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to really understand yeah. things. And the more and more I, and I know it's not that simple, but, um, I think I can, you know, w- when I know when I had shrinkage five times in a row, I know I can do it. Mm-hmm. So I can keep, I can keep doing it. Uh, and I'm just trying to stay positive and, uh, you know, listen, listening, I was on with you. Uh, I know it was, it was the same day as you, but last night I was on with you and that Dr. Ead, that Dr. Mm-hmm. Ead, she, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to, now she's a new doctor. I'm adding to my, to my list of doctors that, you know, I'm trying to pick apart some things that my mind is going to help my body too. Yeah. Oh, well, definitely. And yeah, the glutamine side of things is important. I didn't know that about, about metastases in the liver being more uh, dependent on glutamine. That, that's really interesting. Very important. To know. Yeah. Um, even, even if you don't, we make glutamine, we make glucose, we get glucose and glutamine in a lot of the things that we eat. Uh, yes. We can cut out the glucose, hard to cut out the glutamine because it, it's just in everything. It's in plant proteins. It's in animal proteins. We make it it's difficult to cut this stuff out unless you fast, you know, and yes. I think that, that and the GKI lowering abilities of fasting, I think are, are really, really strong uh, things to recommend fasting in cancer. As long as you refeed and you get, and you're, and you're not losing too much weight because obviously you, your body needs to run and needs to operate and it needs to fight off the cancers as well. Um, interestingly enough, when you lose weight, actually a good thing, when you lose abdominal visceral fat, the inside around the organ fat, that this actually improves the cancer outcomes as well. This was shown out of Trinity college in Dublin, uh, last year, the year, I think it was just last year. Um, well, I actually played rugby for Trinity, and that was what made nice. me interesting going to you know uh, overseas for for medical school because I I, I knew people that uh, coach over there. My one of my favorite coaches was the coach there, and I wanted to play for him. and uh, And I knew people over there playing, and so awesome. uh, they actually figured out that uh, your your visceral fat sequesters and binds and pulls in natural killer T cells, which are your first line cellular defense against cancers. And they, they suck up these precancerous cells. They also attack cancerous cells. And so when you have more visceral fat around the organs, then you have less NKT cells. And we've known this for a while. We just didn't know why, but they discovered uh, a receptor where they actually bind onto the NKT cells and pull them in. They don't let them go. And so you have to physically lose that visceral fat to start releasing out these NKT cells. And that's why people that have more visceral fat or more generally just, you know, obesity, that's how, how it's quantified. Um, they have higher cancer rates and worse outcomes. So they have, have lower, low, you know, higher mortality rates really, and worse five-year survival rates. Um, and then it goes, goes down, you know? So obviously, you know, skinny people do get cancer and they do uh, get very sick and can die from cancer, but this is something that can help. And, you know, fasting, carnivore diets, you know, you look at Dr. Sean O'Mara, that's, it's so funny how all these, all these different doctors and all these different people come to a carnivore diet for very different reasons, right? So yes. I came to it because I just learned how toxic plants were. I'm like, well, not eating that crap. And then Dr. Ede had done it because it made such a massive difference to her mental health and her patient's mental health. And as a, as a Harvard psychiatrist that, you know, she, she was able to figure that out and start doing studies and showing that this really worked. Then, you know, Dr. O'Mara, you know, he he studied visceral fat and how bad this was for you. Well, what's the best way to get that out? Carnivore diet, sprinting, weightlifting. So, you know, we all come to this from, from different angles, which is really interesting. We're all coming to the same conclusion. This is the best way to eat. 
and uh, and it's the healthiest for us. Um, um, yeah. What was I going to say? Oh, about the I was just wanted to expand when you when you said uh, you 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 came to the can uh, the carnivore diet because you you realized plants were trying to kill you and, and my, my son Dante loves when you say that uh, <laughs> he repeats it all the time plant when my, when, and my wife's a keto so when she tries to make she asked Dante hey do you want a broccoli she's like mom plants are trying to kill you <laughs> he says right away like you trying to so put it like, like what, yeah exactly <laughs> and I think you you've said in your stories on and on, like you were in a cancer biology class yeah and was that right and that professor is the one that said it that's it. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, I really want to find this guy. I've, I've tried looking through online to see like, you know, um, where this class, I, I, I can't even find the, the damn class. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure which term it was, you know, so that's probably, I just need to go through just term by term by term and just see. But you that. remember his, you remember his name and everything that I professor. Don't. I don't, you don't. <laughs> no. Yeah, I don't. I, you know, that's, um, well, he's got a, um, like, he's got to watch one of your videos and he's, he's got to contact you sometime because, that's, uh, that's yeah. what I'm sort of hoping that I, yeah. there were 30 other people in that class too. And I'm not, I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, not convinced that that's the only time he ever said that, you know, for sure. So, <laughs> so university of Washington, early two thousands, yeah. cancer biology, Plants are trying to kill you. Anyone remembers that or heard a story about that or has a crazy yes. uncle who's just spouting off this nonsense, you know, put him in touch with me. Contact you. Me. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. Um, no, that's awesome. Yeah, that was it. You know, so yeah, he he was a yeah, cancer biology professor. And he said, don't eat plants. <laughs> it's just not good for you. Dr. Gundry you know, wrote the, the, the plant paradox book. And he says too, yes. plants don't want you to eat them. They protect themselves. This is, this is the, the normal yes. sense mechanism. And then he says, this is a paradox because of course we have to eat plants. Of course we don't have to eat plants. Yeah. I, that's where I, yeah. Well, I, 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 I used to watch Dr. Stephen Gundry, but I stopped watching him because I don't like his paradox uh, theories. <laughs> I, I, think, I think you, I think you take, you, I think you take, yeah. you know, parts that, that, that work like, you know, like, you know, Dr. No, absolutely. He's certainly not carnivore, but I love his work on fruit, fructose. And that's something that is, is a great addition to yes. And, you know, Dr. Gundry, well, that's the thing. Paradoxes don't exist. That's why they're yeah. called paradox. Oh, it's a paradox. Two things that's that right. can't exist, but they do, but they don't because they can't. Yes. Right. That's, that's the whole point. They you know what? You bring up doctor. Sorry. You bring up doctor. Sorry to interrupt there. You bring okay. up Dr. Lustig. I, I don't want Dr. Lustig. I don't want to forget because I had a bunch of things I wanted to like get through with you today. And, and, you know, I, we've been talking about my cancer and professor mm -hmm. Seafrid and, you know, the, you know, the metabolic disease. And, all, and I'm like, I want to, I want to delve into like longevity a little bit with Dr. Shafee. And, you know, maybe, maybe the next time you and I get together, maybe I'm going to be more cancer free yeah. and, uh, and, and we can, we can get into like longevity, but just yesterday I had a great day with my son. Uh, we were traveling to hyperbaric chamber and every time we travel, we listen to podcasts now. Like my son wants to, he's like, Hey dad, who do you want to listen to today? And I go, bring up that, uh, bring up that Dr. Robert Lustig because there was, and it's, and I was, it's about an hour and a half long and he's with Andrew, Andrew Huberman. Mm. Uh, yeah. And you know who professor Huber, Andrew is uh, yeah. from? Yeah. Yeah. And they're, and they're great. They're both really intelligent human beings and, yeah. and they're just, back and forth and i guess andrew uh Huberman, he likes his berries and he's talking about like he's talking and then and then he's explaining the fructose situation there and what's going on in, in your liver and stuff like that so i i really like lust i really like listening to lustig andrew huberman um i started listening to peter atia a little bit um but once again you know i'm in love with the carnivore diet and I don't think Peter Atia is. So I, I you know, I'm just, no, no. So, so I, I, I have to pick and choose the people that I'm really following. Um, in terms of, sorry, I'm going to ask you a question now in terms of longevity, <laughs> in terms of longevity, Dr. Shafee, uh, is, is there certain gurus that you like to look to and follow, uh, that help, help guide your life in terms of I know you, you, you talk about it all the time. Humans can live to a hundred or 120 years old. Like what motivates you in terms of longevity and, and who, who are your mentors that you look up to? 
So, I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, I, I work with, with a guy who's been in, in this field of longevity for 40 years, you know, and that, and it's, he runs the, the functional medicine practice that I, that I work at. He's since retired from seeing patients, but he's, uh, he's still the medical director. And so I've learned a lot from him and he's all, all for, I mean, he's, he's been, he's been talking about the research on, you know, metformin and, and all these sorts of things long before uh, uh, I ever heard about, uh, you know, David Sinclair and before he became a, you know, a big, you know, sort of a, a, a you know, well-known figure, you know, so I learned this stuff from them. But the, the thing is, is that, you know, when I, when I talk to my patients and they start getting interested in these things, well, about this, I was like, well, you can look, there's, there's, there are these studies, a lot of them are in animal models. Obviously we don't have, you know, massive human trials and things like that. You really can't, you know, you have to do these things very, very, very long-term through the course of someone's entire life. And you can't control for things and, and for everything, but, you know, mechanistically, you know, this stuff makes sense. Um, but I figure that, okay, well, wrap them in animal models. Yes. It, you know, does, has been shown to extend life. Great. But, you know, is that, is that because there's something unique and individual about rapamycin, low dose rapamycin or metformin or aspirin that all else being equal, they will just improve your life and they will just fix something that's wrong and improve something that's not as good as it could be. I don't know. Because the thing is that a lot of these things, a lot of what these things do is undo a bit of the harm that we are just causing ourselves. And so if if it if you're sort of doing a standard diet, yeah, it'll still probably help. Certainly metformin. You know, there's a lot of there's yeah. a lot of studies on that. You know, it's lowering your blood sugar, it's lowering your insulin. One of the one of the major uh, biomarkers for longevity is is low fasting insulin. And yes. so that's going to help you achieve that. You know, what's going to help you achieve that more don't eat carbs, you know, yeah. if, you just, if you just eat a carnivore diet, you're going to always have low blood sugar. You're always going to have low insulin. It's just going to be optimized in that standpoint. Uh, obviously maybe not therapeutic for cancer, but, but for just for normal life, you're just going to have low blood sugar, low insulin, and you're gonna have low glycation rate, low AGEs, advanced glycation end products, and you're going to live longer. You know, so I think of this, you know, the, can these things give you a couple extra years in that context of eating some crappy diet and doing bad things to yourself? And this sort of mitigates that? Sure. You know, but we're already, you are, you're already going to regain decades just by eating a biologically appropriate diet because we're genetically designed to live 120 years and we're dying in our 70s. So, you know, if you start this early enough, you should be able to live healthily. 120 years, 130 years, right? Without doing anything special, without taking the metformins and the rapamycins and the aspirins and things like that. You know, and, and heart disease is a major killer. Aspirin helps with that. It's a clotting disorder. You get damage to your artery walls and you get a clot and you get scarring and clot and scarring, clot and scarring. Aspirin helps mitigate that. So, you know, can you, can you survive longer if you take aspirin in that context where you're damaging yourself and building up atherosclerosis? Sure. But if you're not doing that in the first place, is it helping you? Well, it's not going to help you if you fall off a ladder, you know. And when I when I see people, you know, in the hospital and they they've had a an accident and they crack their head, but they're on aspirin and you know a NOAC, one of these novel uh, um, uh, anti um, anticoagulants. I mean, it's it's a death sentence, you know. They have a crack to the head. They it would be um it would be you know sort of a bad injury, but it wouldn't be a catastrophe. But because they're on these blood thinners, their head's full of blood, their pupils blown, and we can't operate because they're on, you know, aspirin and and this this irreversible blood thinner, you know. So it's just like, well, maybe that's not a, such a great idea. So you know, I'm a bit agnostic to it. I don't take any of that stuff. Um, so you, you don't know, you I, you don't take you don't you don't take metformin. No. Nah. No, you don't need to. I, I know it, even like uh, I did a call with, yeah, I did a call with Dr. Hampton and he, he had like if stage four cancer patients suggestions and, and that was on the list. I, I I asked my friend Dwight, who's pretty knowledgeable too. He, he doesn't think I need it. And that's why I think I started taking berberine because it's more of a natural version of metformin. But like, I don't know. I, I think, do, do you I think, think metformin would be beneficial for me at, with cancer? You know, if I were, if I, it, it would, if, 
you know, from the C free point of view, if this is something I had, I would certainly consider it yeah. and I would try it okay. and I would see what that did to my, my glucose, and my GKI, because that's the important thing is the GKI. And if the metformin yes. helps that, then that's great. Um, yes. Berberine, you know, we call it like a more natural thing, but you know, as, as we yeah. know, these natural things are often toxic and deadly, right? So, you know, They're arsenic, they come from plants, they come from plants, they that's come from it. plants. That's it. Right? And so, you know, and, and is, are you getting berberine? Is that, I haven't looked too closely. I don't even know if that's a chemical, if that's just like an herbal supplement that has something in it yeah. that could do this. Yeah. If it's an herbal supplement, it's got 5,000 other things in it that may or yes. may not be good for you, probably aren't. Then you're getting, you're getting the bad with the good. And whereas metformin, you know, the exact dose, you know, exactly what you're getting. And there's nothing else with it. It's just the metformin. And so, yeah. you know, I, I, I would prefer that if it were me. And, uh, as an aid to get, to get my GKI down, um, I would look at other options too. I would definitely look at, at the glutamine options. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily a secret. You know, this is something that, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to work a bit on with professor Seafried is, is a protocol for GBM and other cancers of, uh, of, you know, how to, how to sort of do ketogenic metabolic therapy and, and get a protocol together for patients and doctors to sort of follow. And part of that is the glutamine disruption side of things and so in that paper Seafree goes through and you know Seafried and, and his team went through I, I had a very minor role in this you know I'm going to be like a you know 27th author on this thing you know but it's sure. um you know but as a result I got a chance to sort of you know look through it you know with them and sort of give my two cents and um you know they spoke about how um you know, you could use different sorts of, like, like Dawn, you know, which is the, the, it's, it's a chemo agent. I think they were using it in like leukemia. I, I just don't think less it's hot, less toxic, right? That's basically Seaford's thing. It's le way less toxic than chemo, the Dawn. Well, it is. Oh God. Yeah. Yes. But it, but it used yeah. to be used for leukemia. I think it did. And obviously probably that's why, you know, it, it attacks glutamine and disrupts glutamine. Um, but it has been licensed for cancers is the point. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's annoying that we, we can't get this, you know, used in human trials, um, for people, for, for other cancers as well. Um, but there are other things as well. And it's in the paper, it talks about it, things like fenbendazole, medbendazole, which are these antiparasitics, and they have a similar sort of action to, to disrupt glutamine. These are obviously off label. Metformin is going to be off label, but people take metformin yeah. off label just for longevity purposes. You know, and that's just that just means your insurance isn't going to cover it, and uh, yeah. you just have to pay for it yourself. But that that's okay. Um, and so, you know, those sorts of things, I I would do that. You know, that is what I would do, and I would I would go to that paper that that's going to be published from from Professor Seafried and other papers that he's studied on the subject as well. Go through that and do that that protocol, that press pulse protocol. It's constant pressure of low GKI through a combination of fasting and a carnivore diet. And then every now and then just hit it hard with yeah. the GKI or with the, um, with the glutamine disorders, probably sure. while I was fasting, you know, to really just nail this sucker. And, yeah. um, you know, and that, that's how I would approach it. You know, if I had to, if I yeah. had these things. Well, thanks a lot. And I'm trying to take what you're just saying and professor Seafrid and, all his studies and his papers, I've been reading quite a bit of them. Um, and I am trying to embed that. And I think that's where I'm at right now um, to up my game. So and I'm pretty, I'm pretty pumped. I'm pretty motivated uh, yeah. because it sounds like uh, there's some great results happening. Yeah, That's all I have to say. That's all I have to yeah. say, I guess, for yeah. that one. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the main thing is, is, you know, working with your doctors, working with your team, um, obviously, you know, this isn't medical advice on anyone to how, how to treat their cancer. I'm just saying what I would do, but I would also put this in the context of what I was, uh, what I was doing, depending on the cancer. If it was something that was amenable to chemo and radiation, I would entertain that. If it was something yes. like a GBM probably wouldn't just because they don't, they don't add too much to the equation and they no. you know, come with their, their burden as well. And so, you know, but if it was something that was, mm -hmm. was something that, that did have a higher success rate with chemo and radiation, I would do that. But I'd be in ketosis the whole time because studies have shown that being in ketosis, when you go through chemo and ra radiation, sensitizes the cancer cells to the chemo and radiation. So the can more cancer cells die and also protects your, your, uh, your healthy cells, your normal cells 
against the chemo and radiation. So I would definitely do that exactly as you're doing. And then, you know, work with my doctor, because the thing is you, you, you don't want to take random medication. You still need to work with your doctors. So you yeah. can talk to your doctor is, you know, have them, you know, prescribe off label if they're comfortable doing that for the metformin and any of the, the other sort of, you know, glutamine disruptors, if they're able to, but you need to work with your doctor because especially if you're taking chemo, this can yes. interact and you can have, you can have interactions and interference with that, which can be very dangerous. And so it's not something that, that people should just do on their own. Like you still need. No, I, absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I've, I've been, because I ventured into the YouTube world and I now have a lot of cancer friends mm. and everybody's different and everybody's at different levels. Not everybody's at the level I'm at in terms of attacking things, but there's this one fellow, like every time he reads something or sees a video, he's like, Jeff, we got to get this. Jeff, we got to get that. Jeff, we, and next thing you know, he's ordered it. And he's already taken it before I've even like read his paragraphs. <laughs> it's what, yeah. like, I'm like, and, the, and, and I get it. Some people are really desperate, but I try to do, um, all my legitimate research and talking to people. I was on with Professor Seaford two weeks ago, just him, and me, and Carrie. And when it came to fembendazole, I was re I've been really getting intrigued by it. And I said to him, I said, "Is this something I should do on my off chemo week? Is this something I should I can do with chemo?" When I said, "Is, this, is it, can I do it with chemo?" Right away, he goes, "Why not? Absolutely, you could." So when I heard him say that, um, I think, but I think. Um, I don't think it's going to affect the chemo from, from what, what he said, but like you said, I think everything works better when I'm off the heavy toxins or I'm in the therapeutic state of ketosis. Like even I was just reading studies about hyperbaric uh, treatment and, and, and Dr. Seifert actually talks about this too, because he's done studies on hyperbaric oxygen mm -hmm. treatment too. When you go into those chambers in a heavy state of ketosis, it works like four times as well nice. as opposed to like, just go like, so, and that's where like, even, even the, there's, so the, the center I go to for hyperbaric, it's actually really good. It's close to Toronto, Canada, and it's probably one of the better ones. I did my research before I signed up for a, a treatment. There's like three doctors in there and they check my glucose all the time. Cause I guess there's a correlation between sometimes people that, get a uh, very low glucose and are in there, they could cause seizures. So they're very precautious about that. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side of things, professor Seifried has done studies and have watched people how in a therapeutic state of ketosis, which means your glucose is pretty low um, for cancer patients, the, the, the oxygen around the cells work a lot. It works four times better. Like, so, so it's, you know, I, I'm constantly like, I I'm, I make sure all my doctors, my face-to-face -face doctors, my oncologists, my this, I always explain to them what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. Um, sometimes they need to know the the research, like even the receptionist yesterday, he said, I want you to talk to the doctor before you go into hyperbaric. And I, I cause he knew I was, I was, I wasn't fasting yesterday, but next Tuesday, like I'm going to be going to hyperbaric Tuesday and Thursdays on my non chemo week. So I'm eating. And then on my chemo week, which is next week, I'm just going to go one day before chemo um, on Tuesday and I'll be into a two day fast already. So I'm trying to warn these doctors, like my glucose is going to be low. Don't be afraid to put me in there uh, because you know, I, I, I know I can handle it and I know I can attack those cancers better when I'm in a, in that therapeutic state of ketosis. So you have to, like you said, I love it. Uh, I, I'm learning so much today from you, uh, Dr. Shafee. And I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I feel like every time I talk to you or Seafred or Baker or anybody, I'm like, I'm in a, I'm in a science classroom that, you know, I wish, I wish I would, you know, I wish I would have paid attention a little more when I was in school sometimes because I'm learning more now and I'm, and I'm writing notes, um, big time. Well, you know, the thing is, well, you have two degrees, man. It's not like, you know, you yeah. didn't, you didn't study, you know, well, but, but the thing is, is that you're interested in what you're interested in when you're interested yeah. in you know, and if, and if we came at you with this same stuff when you were 18, you probably been like, Oh my God, I don't care. No. You know, and it's just like, but, but it's real for you now. And it's interesting. Yeah, it is. It, it is know? real for me. And when I first started teaching high school phys ed, I actually, half of my sections were phys ed and the other, I actually, for about five years, I taught grade nine science, which was like cell division in, in the Ontario curriculum. So like 
mitosis out of control is cancer. And I remember teaching it, but I was like, I was in my early twenties and I'm like, I don't know, like this mitosis cell division thing. I'm like, yeah, you know, I really didn't understand it as well as I do now. And the oncology section in the grade nine science textbook, uh, my son, Peter, he's taking it right now. He's in grade 10 science. And they were, he's like, he took a photo of it like a couple of weeks ago and goes, dad, look what we're learning. And, and it's all about genetic mutation theory of cancer. And he's like, dad, this is all wrong. My, my son, my son, Peter is sending me this in the middle of the day, taking a photo of stuff in, in class. And I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's wrong. Like there, there's obviously Seifert explains there's two different uh, theories of, of what cancer is. Uh, I, and I think there's a minute, a very minimal types of cancer that are maybe genetic mutations, but the majority of them um, are caused metabolic, metabolically. And, and we're not even a lot of the textbooks aren't a hundred percent correct in how they explain things all the time. I find. Yeah. Well, that's why textbooks get changed, you know, and they get, they get new yeah. additions and, uh, and we, and we yeah. build on these things. You know, there's certain theories that are the more popular theories, the ones they know about. There's a great book called the big bang never happened. And it goes through the yeah. physics and the math and the science about how that couldn't have happened. And, um, you know, it just does, it doesn't, it, you know, the, these physical laws are just getting in the way. The universe is much older than that. It's hundreds of billions of years old, at least to form all these galaxies and clusters of galaxies and super clusters of galaxies and giant alpha helixes of super clusters of galaxies. There's just no way that that formed in 13 billion years in the way that they said it did. And it's like, well, interesting. No one has heard that unless you have a dad who's a physicist and like read the book and get yeah. like, you need to read this, you know? And so <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, uh, you just, you just don't hear these things. And you, but even in medical school, it's just like, yeah, you get these series of genetic changes. They just build up and build up. And then all of a sudden cancer, you know, but it's so, so easy to disprove that, you know, it's like you, you take the nuclei from cancer cells with all the genetic changes, you put those into a healthy cell or, or, or otherwise healthy cell with healthy mitochondria it doesn't behave as cancer. It's that simple. So it's not yeah. the genes. It's, you know, the, the genes are very important, but they aren't, they, they don't run the ship. That's not, that's not the actual brain. You know, those are blueprints. That's, that's the code. That's the memory, right? Yes. The mitochondria are, are the, the the actual workers. They're the brain. They're the ones moving. They're the ones using that. So they're the architects and the workers and the builders that use the blueprints to then go do something with it. So, you know, the blueprints don't build the building, you know? Yeah, absolutely. The workers and the, and the architects. The workers too. Yeah, that's, that's right. It. And so, you know, and then you take those healthy mitochondria, you put them in a cancer cell, stops the cancer. So, you know, there are, so there, there are genetic, predispositions a lot of these things will will actually damage the mitochondria so a lot of these genetic predispositions that that set people up for cancer actually do damage the mitochondria they can do other things as well but one of the things they do is damage the mitochondria a lot of these plant toxins they that are known to be carcinogenic damage the mitochondria you know radiation damages mitochondria all these different things damage the mitochondria and when you're not in ketosis you can't go through mitophagy. You can't roll these things over. You can't recycle them. You can't break them down. You know, yes, you do get autophagy from fasting. You also get autophagy from not eating carbohydrates. If you just have low insulin, you're going to be going through autophagy. You are going to be going through mitophagy. And this is why it's been shown that after a few months on a ketogenic diet, you have four times the number of mitochondria and they're four times as effective because they've replaced out the older damaged, broken down, slower moving mitochondria and replace them with newer, faster, better ones. And you can you, you do that, you keep doing that and you keep your health, your mitochondria healthy. It's, it's, you're going to be in much, much better position to not get cancer and have to deal with this stuff. Yes. In the first place. I wish, I wish there was some device that I could prick and it tells me if I'm in the state of mitophagy, <laughs> like, <laughs> I like, if you're, yeah. if you're in ketosis, you will be, you know, okay. but that sounds good. Deep, deep ketosis. I mean, you don't have to have like, yeah. you know, massively elevated ketones or anything like that. If you just don't yeah. have carbs and your insulin is low, you will, yes. you will be going through mitophagy. You will be turning That's good. your, your, uh, your, uh, mitochondria, you know, in the cancer cells, 
they're probably just too damaged and too destroyed to even go through that. You know, there's, there's a sort of a point of no return that, that Seafree talks about, you know, they get damage, damage, damage. And after this, this point, it's just, that's it. They're, they're not going to, they can't turn, they can't write the ship for those cells, but you write yes. the cells for all the, you know, you write it, write the ship for all the other cells. And gotcha. then, you know, you cut off the food supply and the energy yes. for those cells. Start them. Those ones die off. Yeah, exactly. So that's yeah. what, and that's what, and, that, and that's where I think a lot of people, when people say starve the cancer cells, it's not, there's more to it than just mm. not eating. Like there's, you got to make sure you're monitoring all those different levels. Like you say, speaking of levels, that's another thing I think Dwight tells me, I, you got to get a, like there, we can't buy these, this levels where it analyzes <laughs> at the cellular level. I need to get one of those devices, the levels, they call it, right? Level Ben Bickman, ben, levels? ben Bick. Yeah. The company levels. I think Ben Bickman was huge on bringing that in. Um, it was, I don't know. I don't know Ben Bickman's involvement with it, but, um, there's a Dr. Casey means, um, okay. she's a Stanford trained head and neck surgeon. Um, but then she sort of left that and went into functional medicine and, uh, and metabolic medicine and founded the company levels. Her brother, yeah. interestingly enough, is the, the whistleblower for the, the food and drug companies telling people how the food companies, you know, processed food companies, Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Kellogg's and all these, you know, the, the usual suspects that they, yes. that they are knowingly putting this stuff out there and they know that it causes disease. They know that it causes metabolic dysfunction. Wow. They know that it causes harm. They know that this is making us sick. And they, and he says, he knows that they know this because he's been in the boardroom meetings with them when they spoke about it, you know? And wow. So, and so who's this, who's Casey? Casey means is she a professor or doctor? Uh, no, she so she's a doctor. She's an MD. Um, yeah, from Stanford. I know she did her um, residency at, at Stanford. Um, I think okay. she went to Stanford Medical School as well. And so, very bright lady. I ha I've had her on my podcast. Very nice. Okay. And so she founded the company Levels that does like the yes. CDM sort of stuff. Maybe, I got to start maybe connecting with her. Yeah, yeah, learning some more things from her, maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, she's, uh, be awesome. it, it was, I, I learned a lot from that. I mean, you know, some of it was more applicable to, you know, people that eat carbohydrates and how to sort of mitigate that. It was very, you know, one thing quickly was not that I eat carbs or salad or anything like that, but she said just the simply the order in how you eat your meal. Yes. Makes a difference. Yes. Like if big you time. Had, yeah. Start with the fat, right? Yeah, the meat and fat. Yeah. Protein and fat. Yeah. So if you had, if you had the steak, salad and a potato if you ate the steak first then had the salad then you know took a bit of a break and then you had the potato that your yeah. blood sugar would not spike as high and your insulin would not spike as high yes. as if you had the potato first and if you went and just went on a walk for 20 minutes after your meal that also will will keep your blood sugar lower it. down and bang out bang better. out some push-ups get the glycogen get the glycogen out of your muscles right away yeah we'll just get get, get the yeah get the get the body moving get the blood moving and yeah. you know, get that that sugar out of the bloodstream and into your muscles yes because that's that's yeah yeah, yeah. That's what that's gonna do yeah gotcha yeah well, that's awesome i'm learning so much i know i'm, I'm yeah. i wish I, I had more time with you i i had a you know and I, I think maybe we can do maybe we can if you don't mind in like in a few months or so we could connect again we, I think, we uh, definitely I had a, yeah. Yeah. I think because I just had a lot of topics like, I, you know, we got into longevity. Um, I would love to talk about like carnivore and youth a little mm -hmm. more. I know yeah. we did a thing on carnivore and kids, especially with my two sons, uh, because they're both thriving. Yeah. Uh, Peter, the 15, the, 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 Peter's more carnivore. Dante's, Dante's carnivore too, but a little more ketivore. Mm -hmm. and, and then even talking about athletes, because, you know, that's where someone I really relate to you and I admire you, Dr. Shafee, you being a professional rugby player. I want to talk more about stuff like that too and how to and how diet affects performance and stuff like that. Because I, I wanted to tell you too, uh, I played, I really enjoyed, I, I played rugby in high school too. I played rugby in grade 11. Yeah. Grade 11, 12. And we had a grade 13 when I was in high school. So oh. three years in a row. And in, in my, in my, in my fifth year of high school, before I went to university in grade 13, I actually, uh, went on a tour on spring break with my high school team to Ireland. Oh, awesome. And so I, 
yeah, so I, I played in Dublin. Uh, Mona Vey was one city and Cork, Cork was another city. Cork's cool. And uh, yeah, and I, I, just, I, and I love rugby. And uh, I just want to tell you, I, was a, I, I, I started as a winger because I was yeah. super fast. Yeah, but then nice. I moved into the, I moved into the fullback position um, because I was, I was actually pretty good at like uh, kicking. Uh, so I was able to punt and even kick the, the extra points. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I really love rugby. So I, I, I wouldn't mind talking to you more about that and other sports and athletes Mm -hmm. and how, how carnivore is like carnivore is like, it really is the ultimate diet for athletes too. Um, I've never in my life experienced any, any better performance than, than that. Um, Yeah. Absolutely, man. I'd love to have you back on. Um, let's do it again. Let's set it up. And, sure. Um, Sounds good. Doesn't doesn't have to be months. You know, we can set it. We can do it, yeah. do it before that. Yeah. That's great. But uh, thank you so much, man. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank yeah. you very much for for sharing your story with everybody. I think it's, I think it's you know, every time I hear it, it's it's just you know more and more inspirational that you're just you know you're just teeming with life and you're just going you know to to you know you you know you're you're doing everything that you can to get the best outcome possible. And I think that, you know, that paves the way for other people to say, okay, Jeff did this. He's having good results. This is how I'm going to do it too. And so I, I really appreciate you coming on and letting people know about what you, what you're, what you're doing and how it's going for you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Shafee. And I just, uh, you know, um, I know that your, your uh, subscribers are going to be watching this and I'm very blessed to, they're listening to it, but if you don't, I started my channel uh, to help others. So if anybody knows uh, of anybody going through cancer and they just want to connect that way, they can look me up on YouTube too and and uh, and connect with me that way. Uh, because when I have time, I try to go through uh, my list of emails and comments and and connect with people that are going through something similar. Because you're, you're absolutely right. I think you said it earlier. We're, we're social beings and we need to interact with people. It helps, helps, us, helps us out big time. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Well, no, thank you. And wh- where can people find you and, and you know see your channel and and connect with yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so on YouTube, uh, right about now, I've I've been up for about three months. I'm kind of new to the YouTube world. Um, nice. It's ca- it's called the channel's called uh, Blessings on My Journey, and I I just I thought you know, I still today think that's a pretty good name because I uh, every single day I wake up and I and I'm constantly trying to make everything a blessing in my life every day. And I think you don't have to be going through cancer to have that uh, philosophy, but it's a lot easier for me to, to see it today. So check me out. Blessings on my journey. Thanks. Perfect. Any, any Instagram or anything like that? Or is that the, the um, I'm start, I'm start, I'm starting to get into the Instagram world. Uh, Dwight told me a long time ago, especially when he started sending me YouTube videos. Uh, you got, all the doctors are on the are on the gram. You got to get on the gram, and I kind of boycotted it for a while. So I'm I'm okay. learning how to use it. I I I can't. I, I don't know. I haven't really figured it. I figured it out, but I'm sure I will soon. My son, I'll get my sons to help me uh, figure it out. But I, I am kind of venturing into Instagram a little bit right now too. Okay, cool. Well, definitely check that. Uh, for for everybody watching, you know, thank you very much for listening. I hope you guys found it enjoyable. Please go check out uh, Jeff's page and give him a follow. And, uh, you know, and watch more of his story. And if anybody is unfortunately suffering with cancer or has a friend or family member that is, do check that out. Check out uh, the Seat Free talk, um, conversations as well that I've done, that Jeff has been a part of with uh, Carrie from Homestead Howe. It, you know, the more information you get on this, the better off that you can be. And just the more well-armed you'll be going into a tough situation for anybody. So anybody that has that, um, has that to contend with, please do go check out. Uh, Jeff's work, and we'll see you again very soon. Thanks, Dr. Shafee. Thanks, man.